Good evening, and welcome to the ETHS Auditorium for this evening's presentation by Family Action Network of Dr. Temple Grandin, Visual Thinking. At this time, please take a moment to silence or turn off all electronic devices. Also take a minute to identify the nearest emergency exit indicated by the lighted exit signs throughout the auditorium. Keep in mind that the nearest emergency exit may be located behind you. Finally, in the event of an emergency, please do follow the directions of ETHS staff. Thank you and enjoy this evening's program. Well, welcome. Welcome everyone. We are really excited to have you all here. My name is Taya Kinsey, and I am the Assistant Superintendent Principal here at Evanston Township High School. We are thrilled to welcome everyone back for a Family Action Network, our first in-person event at Evanston Township High School since March of 2020. We have long treasured our partnership with Family Action Network, and I know Dr. Campbell, our superintendent, um, sends his regards and welcome to all of you as well. He was unable to attend and deeply regrets that, but we are so excited to have you all here together. We are so honored to be in the presence of Dr. Temple Grandin. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful executive director, <laughs> who continues her creativity and um, tenacity, even through the pandemic, Lonnie Stonich, Executive Director of Family Action Network. You should, okay, good, all right, sorry, thank you. Sorry, I have a bad cold, so I'm leering away from everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we're grateful for the leadership of Dr. Campbell, the superintendent, new superintendent, and Taya, thank you so much for your partnership, and to the fabulous District 202 staff who work so hard to support our programming here. Um, and then also thanks to the fan staff, our board members, our liaison council, sponsors, donors, everybody who helps keep our programming free, open to the public. We really, really appreciate it. Um, very special thanks to all of our event attendees on Zoom as well, and in person, you're the force behind everything that we're doing, so thank you so much for your support. Um, as Robbie had mentioned, please quiet your cell phones. The format for tonight, Dr. Grandin is gonna deliver a keynote address. Uh, it'll be about 40, 45 minutes. We are gonna take questions from the audience. We're gonna go with a microphone and take questions for maybe about another 20 after that. There, sorry, I'm just not feeling well. There'll be a um, additional book si sale and signing here on, on the stage. For a moment, I thought the mic went dead. Uh, on the stage, and so if you had not purchased a book yet, you can also purchase one afterwards, and she'll be personalizing on stage as well. Um, if you want to stop at the fan table as well to sign up for our newsletter, pick up our October calendar, and now our November calendar as well. A lot of great programming. This is our 40th anniversary year, and so there's a lot of great stuff coming. Yay! Thank you. Okay, so fan is honored. Quite honored to welcome back Dr. Temple Grandin to our community, this time in support of her new book, Visual Thinking. She's a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Animals in Translation, Animals Make Us Human, The Way I See It, The Autistic Brain, and Thinking in Pictures, among others. Um, she has been a pioneer in improving the welfare of farm animals, as well as an outspoken advocate for the autism community. She has appeared on television shows such as 2020, 48 Hours, CNN, Larry King Live, Primetime Live, 60 Minutes, and The Today Show, and she's been featured in many periodicals. And now, let's listen and learn from Dr. Grandin. Great to be here. I understand this is your first live event. I didn't realize that. That's, uh, that's really good. Good to see people out here again. Uh, well, what I want to do is talk tonight about different ways that people think and how that affects education and uh, many other things. And 
The first step is realizing that people think differently. And a lot of people are mixtures of certain different kinds of thinking. But I was shocked when I found out that other people didn't think in pictures the same way I think. And I didn't understand that until I got into my late 30s. That's when I discovered that a lot of other people think in words rather than pictures. And the way I figured that out is if I ask you to think about something like your house or your car, you probably can see that right now. But I ask you to think about something you don't own, like a church staple. I see specific ones. They come up like a series of pictures. The verbal thinker just sees this. I was shocked when I talked to a speech therapist. All she saw was two lines. That was my first inkling that maybe other people didn't think the same way that I think. Well, in my work with animals, I looked at what cattle were seeing. Here's an example of cattle going through a shoot, and uh, they're getting scared by my shadow. Just my shadow is scaring them. You know, uh, people thought it was crazy to be looking at what cattle were seeing. Animals live in a sensory-based world. They don't live in a word-based world. And I didn't know at the time when I started doing this that other people couldn't even imagine how the animal might be able to think or how it would receive things. Now, we need visual thinkers to solve problems in the world. Five years ago, I got a chance to go down to Cape Kennedy. It was really, really fun. Got to visit this launch pad, got to see a SpaceX launch. It was like so cool. Now, people like me can sometimes see something that shouldn't be there. Engineers who are mathematical, they calculate risk. But visual thinkers can see risk. They can also see how mechanical things work. So we're walking around under this launch pad at, f at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I see this little motion on the stairway. There was a raccoon living in it. And I saw some uh, fueling equipment, gauges, electrical panels, things like that that don't really want a raccoon around. Nobody else saw it. Nobody else knew it was in there. There's a rocket sitting on that pad right now. I hope it's been totally raccoon de de re totally gotten the raccoons out of it. Another place you need visual thinkers is to prevent messes like the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown. Um, I, couldn't, I, I was flabbergasted when I found out why it broke. The engineers and the mathematicians had done a great job making it earthquake proof. It shook and it shook and it shook and it shook and it shook. Everything was fine. But then, 20 minutes later, earthquake makes a tsunami, and the tsunami drowned the electric emergency cooling pump. The engineers didn't see the water coming in and flooding the site. You see, I can see that. Simple watertight doors would have saved it, and they didn't have them. Because the mathematician calculates risk, people like me see something that might be risky. Now, we need visual thinkers. Just last night, I was in California, and they have let their electrical grid basically fall apart. And if the wind goes more than 45 miles an hour, they have to turn off the electricity because the wires are going to fall down because they never maintain anything. No, we need the visual thinkers. We're the ones who are going to get stuff done. No, so what kind of thinker are you? Would you rather read the directions? or look at the diagrams. And in my book, Visual Thinking, I show a lot of, um, of studies in there to show that these different kinds of thinking exist. And when a kid gets a label, like autism or dyslexia or something like that, they're more likely to be an extreme visual thinker, maybe an extreme mathematical thinker. Would you rather look at the map or read the directions? I would much rather look at the map. In fact, I like to look at the whole map before I do the trip so I know where I'm going. I'm not going to just blindly follow the GPS. Now, in science, things have been getting more and more mathematical. And one of the problems with my kind of visual thinking mind is I can't do algebra. Higher math's very difficult for me. But you need people like me to make sure multi-million dollar cancer studies don't get messed up so that people report accurately what the methods were in an experiment. Millions of dollars worth of research were wrecked 
because one lab uses magnetic stirrer and the other lab uses little Ferris wheel thing to mix their cancer samples. It totally changed the results. You have to say in the methods exactly what equipment you used. I was just reading um, Nature magazine um, just before I came here, and they retracted a major paper on squeezing carbon to make it superconducting, you know, sort of like Superman squeezing the lump of coal makes a diamond out of it. Well, they didn't tell the readers what kind of carbon they used. See how basic that is? That's why you need somebody like me who's not mathematical. Now, I stayed at your nice little hotel here, and they have really interesting old books in there. Old, um, you know, world literature book. I thought the preface was great. It came, just came right out and said, they, oh, there's been a lot of nonsense written about the Greeks. And then I found an old electrical engineering book from 1930 on the shelf in there. And I took a picture of, of some of the pages in that because there's math in there, but the math is directly tied to a specific thing, like on how a generator works or how an amp meter works. It's not math in the abstract. And I was looking through that book where I failed a regular algebra class, but maybe this course, I could do it. You see, things are getting less and less and less visual. Uh, my students' physiology books right now, it's all chemistry and stuff like that, but how does the kidney work? It doesn't tell those basics. See, that's the visual thinking side. Stuff has gotten much more and more mathematical, but then we have millions of dollars worth of research wrecked because they didn't um, specify which mixing device they used. There's three different ways of thinking. I'm what's called an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture. Now, the kinds of things that my kind of mind's good at is inventing mechanical equipment, fixing mechanical equipment, graphic design, photography, working with animals, and real high-end skilled trades. There's, there's four things, art, mechanics, animals, and photography. Those four things go together. But the things I can't do is algebra. And just the other night in California, I gave a talk at a school, and I was talking to their headmaster, who was an English major. And I think I kind of blew his mind. Because when I started explaining to him that everything I think about is a picture, he almost couldn't believe it. And I'm very concerned that we're screening out people that can fix things like the power grid falling apart and stuff like that, because they can't do algebra. I can do the old-fashioned arithmetic, but I can't do algebra. And a lot of the people that I worked with that built complicated equipment in big factories were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And we need the skills, and we need them really badly. Now, the spatial visualizer, that's your mathematician. They think in patterns. They're the ones that can do all the math. Now, if you want to do quantum computing, you want to do chemistry, yeah, you're going to need algebra. Um, programming computers, I tried programming a computer. I couldn't do it. And so you look at something like, you know, somebody wrote something really stupid the other day in a magazine saying a car is just a rolling computer. No, it is a mechanical device controlled by a computer. There's a big difference. There's still lots of mechanical parts of that car where you need my kind of thinker to keep it going. I tried computer programming. In fact, I tried the exact same computer that um, Bill Gates had access to. He could do it. I could not. So I'm a big fan in the schools of exposing students to whole lots of different things. And then, of course, you have your word thinker. Thinks totally in words, writers, uh, lawyers, teachers, politicians. It's all word-based. And then there's a lot of people that are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. Now, there's research that shows that these different kinds of thinking actually exist. And there's a whole chapter in my new visual thinking book um, that goes over the research. There's some older research, and there's some newer research. And one of the reasons why I didn't find some of the older research right away is I didn't have this magic word, object visualizer. You type in visual thinking, you won't find the papers. But you type into Google Scholar, object visualizer, then you will find the papers. And thinking's kind of a continuum. 
Lots and lots and lots of people are mixtures. But usually, one kind of thinking kind of predominates. Turns out I got a huge um, visual thinking um, uh, circuit in my head. Yep, I left out the algebra circuits. But I looked at this old electrical engineering book, and I think that maybe I might actually be able to do that course. It'd be a lot of work, because they'd tell you how some electrical piece of equipment worked, and then right beside it was the math. So there's certain math that was very specific, was connected to solving problems with certain real things. See, that I can do. When the math gets into the abstract, I can't do it. So in eye gaze studies, let's say you want to explain to somebody how a water pump works, the object visualizer will look at the pictures, the verbal thinker reads the text, and the mathematician tends to look at both. Now here's an interesting way that students um, kind of go about doing projects. It was an interesting study done high school students, art students, science students, which would be more mathematical, and humanities students. And the art students made fantastic planets, skyscrapers coming out of them. Another group made a crystalline planet, another one with palm trees and polar bears on the, on the planet. The science students just drew a round circle, kind of described it, you know, the atmosphere, the gravity. And the humanities students started using words, but then they thought that was against the rules, so they crossed out the words and just made splotches. But the other thing that was interesting is that the art students and the science students had elaborate planning sessions to design their planet, and the verbal thinkers didn't plan. Because one of the things about verbal thinking is very top-down. Okay, so I had a student ask me out in California about social justice. Well, you see, my approach would be something a lot more specific, like maybe using DNA to show that this prisoner was innocent and hadn't committed the crime. You see, that's a specific example it's not a broad, top-down thing. I couldn't believe some of the stuff that was going on in California about energy. Uh, I, I, was, I had a window seat going into San Jose, California, and I couldn't believe it. There was very few solar panels on the roofs. Then you fly into some other places, and every warehouse is covered with them. I was really surprised at that. When you've got electrical grid that's falling apart, you're not uh, promoting solar panels. Yeah, we need the people like me, because when I talk about that, I see it. Yeah, those big warehouses, roofs, that's where they belong. I'm trying to remember whether it was the Dallas airport or the Atlanta airport. One of those airports, the, the warehouse roofs are just covered with them. See, now as I'm talking about this, I see it. Verbal thinkers tend to overgeneralize. Well, a lot of top-down stuff, that's politicians. I don't want to get into that. But how do we actually get things done? See, I tend to think in a much more specific way bottom-up thinking, with specific examples of different things you could do to actually get something done. And I gave the students yesterday some examples of sustainability. How about preventing, reducing food waste, for example? Things that supermarkets throw out. Now, that is something that is specific. It's not, it's not abstract. And I see it, and I see day-old bread, and they throw it in the dumpster when that shouldn't have been done. Now, the early inventors probably were my kind of mind. One of my favorite books when I was in fourth grade was about famous inventors, things like cotton gin, sewing machine, grain harvesting equipment. It was all very clever mechanical equipment. In fact, the patent office originally required uh, a, a model. You had to give the patent office a working model. I don't think that would apply to computer programmers. Sewing machine, again, something that's totally mechanical. And the problem is, there's a lot of stuff where we're not making it anymore. I'm very concerned about skill loss. And that's where there's a connection here between what we do in education and what's going on in industry. Well, I've worked in the industry, meat industry for 50 years, spent 25 of those years in heavy construction, where I'd sell a job, design it, supervise its construction. And we've got a real problem. The people that I've worked with that owned metal working shops have retired. They're not getting replaced. It is a big problem. 
And in 2019, right before COVID shut everything down, I went to four places that made me really concerned about skill loss. I went to two state-of-the-art pork processing plants, brand new. The equipment came from Holland. I went to a state-of-the-art poultry plant, brand new. The equipment came from Holland in 100 shipping containers. And I'm seeing more and more of this. Stuff that we're not making because we took shop class out of the schools. Yeah, big, big, big problem. Large 3D printers that are made in Europe. The state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine is from Holland. We invented it, the Dutch made it. Because in the educational system, you can go the university route or you can go more the tech route. And the one place where you don't need a college education is very high-end skilled trades. I'm not talking about asphalt and stuff like roofing and that kind of stuff. The real high-end stuff. And when you look at this machine, look at all the mechanical things on this. Plenty of stuff for my kind of mind to work on, even though I can't do algebra. And a lot of the clever engineers I worked with had barely graduated from high school, but they were in patenting and inventing complicated mechanical equipment. So there was two mistakes that were made 25 years ago. Taking out the shop classes and companies shutting down in-house engineering. Like in my industry, we had um, big in-house engineering departments. We had a place called the Montfort Fab Shop. It's closed now. And after it's been closed for 20 years, then you realize what you've lost. Because I've got clients right now in the meat industry that can't build simple things they need anymore. Because it was cheaper in the short run to contract the work out. And I'm not talking about contracting this work out of the country. This is just contracting it out locally. It was cheaper. And the people that ought to be building these things, they're playing video games in the basement with an autism diagnosis. You see, there's a relationship here. There's a relationship between what goes on in education and stuff that's going on in industry. Everything on that floor, in that state-of-the-art pork processing plant, is mostly from Holland and a little bit from Quebec, Canada. Now that's the parachute landed on Mars. She's taking a selfie of herself landing on Mars. That fabric's from the UK, woven on high-tech European looms. And there's the Steve Jobs Theater. This is the thing that finally blew my mind. Structural glass walls, carbon fiber roof. The walls are from Italy and Germany. I'm going, wait a minute. And the roof is from Dubai. What's going on here? We've got a problem. We eliminated all of these classes. And so what's happened with people like me is I don't know if I could graduate from high school today. I can't do algebra. I can't do a lot of the higher math. Because it's all in the abstract. You know, in the electrical engineering book from the 1930s, well, they had interesting old student textbooks in the rooms. I was just looking at that tonight. And the math is always tied back to something that's a real thing, like a generator or a, you know, a magnetism. Art, sewing, cooking. The other thing that all the classes listed on this slide does is expose kids to things to find out what they might like. Kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff. What we need to be doing with a lot of these autistic kids, I talked to a family last night. They said the kid liked watching all these videos on YouTube with lasers. I said, why don't you get a few laser pointers and show them how to make a light show that's real? We got to get them back to real things. They like cars, get them out doing something with cars. There was one little autistic boy, he liked football on TV. They took him to a real game. Boy, that was a great experience. And he even bought something at the concession stand. And he'd never done that before. These kids need to get out and do a lot more real experiences. And they're going to find out they're going to like those things. Give you a little afraid at first, give them some choice. Go to this concession stand or that concession stand. But doing it online is not the same as real things. Theater. I didn't care about acting in the play. I liked making sceneries and, co and costumes. And when I was in elementary school, I made costumes with my singer so handy which was a toy sewing machine that actually sewed. You know, kids need to be doing this stuff. 
And there's been kids that have been addicted to video games. You know how you can get them off? Mechanics. Another thing we need to be doing a lot more on is maker spaces. I just did a book talk at Harvard. They have a maker space in the physics lab that has crocheting in it. I am not kidding. Sewing machine was in there along with a whole pile of 3D printers. Yeah, they've got to get them doing stuff. But some of the kids that would be the best kids in building stuff, they've screened out. Because there's two parts of engineering. You need the mathematical part, but you also need this visual part. You got a lot of stuff falling apart in this state. Uh, I saw some bridges that were kind of strapped together with some weird cable things. Like, eck. You know, one size doesn't fit all. Now, some people will say, well, the different kinds of thinking and thinking styles doesn't matter. Well, maybe with a lot of people it doesn't. Because if somebody's a mixture, then you can use different methods. But where I think it matters is in the extremes. Like I'm an extreme object visualizer. If I can't make a picture, I don't understand it. I'm also the kind of brain that needs to get out and do a lot of stuff. Because in order to think in pictures, I got to fill my database. Got to fill up my database. I was just reading today in the paper on the airplane about an artificial intelligence program that can create art. Well, in order for it to do that, it has to be shown thousands and thousands and thousands of images of all kinds of stuff. Because you've got to put stuff in the database, and then you can ask if you want a picture of a monkey uh, doing a podcast. So it came up with a cute picture of a monkey with a fancy studio microphone. Well, it has to know what a studio microphone looks like. I couldn't do algebra. Still can't do it. So how did I get a PhD at the University of Illinois? Well, I had to be tutored and tutored and tutored in statistics. I got a C in it as in Charlie. You know, and I'm seeing the algebra requirement preventing a community college student from becoming a veterinary technician or becoming a social worker. You don't need algebra for that. They, 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 maybe they ought to take a business ma a course in math so they can run their business. You know, I'm seeing too many autistic kids that are fully verbal, that have never gone shopping. They're not learning enough life skills. And with the little kids, I don't know how, little kids, you've got to get started working with them very, very super early, really important. You know, now, if they're going to go the mathematical engineering route, then you need the algebra. Or you want to do quantum computing, you're going to need algebra. Yep, I can find the paper from MIT on linear algebra. That paper's not going to do me any good, but I know how to look it up, and I could give it to a student where they'd take off on it. Now, the other big mistake that's made with some of the smart math kids is they force them to do the math sequentially. That's not how these kids think. They just look at it and get the answer. Let them do it that way. Move the kid ahead in math. That's something you need to be doing. We need to be working on developing the thing the kid's good at. And let's apply that math to real things. Field trips. Get them out doing stuff. I saw a dad having the most fun with his three-year-old watching how water goes through a drain from the roof of our building. The water would go to a little concrete gutter and then under a metal plate. And the kid was pulling the leaves out of the gutter and then running around on the other side to watch the water come out. So you can make cool activities with just the most mundane stuff. You need to be doing that. Kids need to be learning working skills before they graduate from high school. That's another thing. Get them out working. Because working skills aren't the same skills as academic skills. I was a terrible student in high school. I was bullied. I was teased. And the only places I was not bullied was friends through shared interests. Only place I was not bullied. And I got kicked out of a regular school for throwing a social studies book at a girl. And I went to special boarding school for kids with problems, and they put me to work running the horse barn. I learned how to work. That is really important. Another thing that really helped me was mentors, starting with my mother, my speech teacher, really good speech teacher, my third grade teacher. 
She explained to the other students that I had a disability that wasn't visible, like a wheelchair, and they shouldn't be teasing me. My science teacher, who encouraged me to study so I could become a scientist. And a really nice uh, man named Jim Uhl, who was starting a small construction business. And he um, uh, seeked me out because he saw my drawings. Now, I want to see these kids getting out and doing things. 20% of the people I worked with that owned metal fabrication companies patenting equipment were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. They're all retired now. They're not getting replaced. I've got a client right now that's getting ripped off by the single shop that is left, 10 times the price of what the thing is worth. That's happened right now. In fact, I talked to them yesterday. Nope, and most of them could not do algebra. You see, they, but the thing is, if like this English teacher that was the principal of this school I talked to uh, two days ago, if you only think in words, they may have a, have a difficult time imagining thinking without words. And they used to say, well, the stupid kids take shop. It's not the stupid kids. It's the kids who think differently. And we need their skills. The thing I want to ask you is, what would happen to some of the top innovators in the past today? What would happen to those people? Michelangelo dropped out of school at age 12, grubby little kid, running around all the churches and seeing great art that was being commissioned. He also grew up with stone cutting tools. You see, that is exposure. Then he got mentored. But the exposure comes first. No, we got to get kids out doing a lot more stuff. There's a very nice um, playground next to where I live. I never seen the kids in that playground. And I know that there's little kids in that building because I've seen the school bus. Steve Jobs bullied in school, tinkered in the neighbor's garage, learned calligraphy. Einstein had no speech until age three. What would happen to him today? And maybe one of the best things that happened to him was getting a job at the patent office because he would have been exposed to so many new ideas there, and they gave him all the electrical stuff. Thomas Edison dropped out of grade school, uh, and was homeschooled by his mom, probably had autism. Well, I'm just thinking about this hotel room I just was in with these old books in it. So someone like Thomas Edison would have been in a place, the library full of things like the 1930s electrical engineering book, um, there was the 1930s version of the American Journal of Psychiatry was in there too. I glanced at that. Well, today they're just getting addicted to devices. If these kids that were spending all this time on devices were getting fabulous jobs in the uh, Silicon Valley industry or in the video game industry, I wouldn't be criticizing them. But they're not. No, we need to be doing things like maker spaces. I couldn't believe it, crocheting in a Harvard physics lab, and it was labeled physics lab. That was kind of a mind blower. Elon Musk is on the spectrum. What would happen to him? He was bullied in school. He was horribly bullied in school. But when he was young, he learned how to work. That's the other thing that's really important. Let's start with chores for little kids. Let's start with volunteer jobs for 11-year-olds, walking the next door neighbor's dog. So they are doing a task for somebody on a schedule, and that boss is outside the family. That is really important. They've got to learn that. I see a lot of parents that just can't let go. They get locked into the label. They're totally locked into the autism label. And they don't think their kid can do anything. And now I'm seeing pictures of people that I know are autistic, undiagnosed, building stuff for me, complicated stuff. And I have to be vague about it because uh, they're not disclosed. But complicated stuff, patentable equipment. A Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to other scientists. That's another reason for keeping all those classes. Painting, music, music. Einstein played the violin. Now I want to talk about my grandfather. MIT trained engineer, mathematician, worked with another guy. This is an example of skills collaborating. So you've got a visual thinker, an object visualizer, working with a mathematical thinker. And they object visualizer came up with this goofy idea for three little coils for an autopilot. 
And they tinkered and they tinkered in a loft where the, over in a building where they fixed trains. Finally got it to work. Everybody in aviation thought it was stupid, but it worked. And then it was stolen. It was in every warplane, World War II, but the stolen version was in every warplane. This is where they needed a lawyer. This is where you needed a verbal thinker. So the thing is, the world really does need all the different kinds of minds, and they can have complementary skills. Let's look at the stuff I've worked on. The object visualizers like me, with a title like drafting person, design the entire plant layout, invent highly specialized mechanical equipment. The mathematicians, boilers, refrigeration, make sure the roof doesn't fall down. The more mathematical parts of engineering. And we have a huge shortage now of electricians, a huge shortage of these things. And we need these people. Well, let's look at the book, Visual Thinking. This is an example of collaboration. I wrote the first drafts. You see, my thinking is associational. It's not linear. Verbal thinkers think very linear. So I write the first drafts, and Betsy Lerner, my totally verbal co-author, would smooth everything out. So we were using the complementary skills. I think that's really important. And we kept just the right amount of detail. Verbal thinkers take out too much detail. I put in too much detail. You have to figure out just the right amount of detail. Let's look at building a building. The architects will be the object visualizers. How can we make the building look nice? Aesthetics. And the engineers, the mathematicians, they've got to make sure it doesn't fall down, that it's safe. But they'll probably give you a concrete box. So you need to have both kinds of minds. That's really important. Now let's look for tips for working with minds that are different. I do a lot of talks to corporations. And one of the things we've got to do is get rid of the regular interview process. Because the way I sold jobs was to simply show off my work, show off my drawings, show off pictures of jobs. I can't multitask. Don't put me on the McDonald's takeout window. Tasks that involve a sequence, like maybe um, uh, doing the cash drawer at Walmart at the end of the day, give me a pilot's checklist. Also, you've got to give these kids choices, but you've got to stretch them. Uh, we've got to limit the electronics and the devices. I'm not seeing good outcomes. They're not getting jobs in the field. I wouldn't criticize it if they were getting jobs in the field. No, they got to get out and do real things. Give them some choices. What's the ultimate goal of education? Where is a student 10 years after high school? I was designing the projects that were shown in the HBO movie. Also, that HBO movie shows exactly how I think. That part of the movie is absolutely accurate. Now, there are some other things where they changed some stuff around, but the visual thinking part's real accurate. Now, I was doing some of my first big livestock design projects. I sold my work by showing off my drawings. Now, one thing I have observed um, since um, the, after the industry went to computer drawing, real recently, we're getting a lot of detail left out of drawings, lots of mistakes on drawings. The people that are drawing them are not seeing the drawing. I had a drawing three years ago for concrete work, and they didn't draw in the reinforcing rod location. I said, you can't just put that in the written spec. You've got to draw that in on the drawing. And weird mistakes in drawings, like they didn't know where the center of the circle was in the wrong place. Stuff like that, they were not seeing it. Now, I designed the front end of every Cargill plant in North America, and that's the drawing right there that I sent to Mr. Fielding, the head of Cargill. I sent it to him, big two foot by three foot drawing. See, an interview for me was put the drawings on the table and show them. But the thing is, you got to show the drawings to the people that will appreciate the drawings. And the guy that might interview terrible could be your best mechanic or your best person for building things. And there's my brochure for my business. And that's one of the pictures that Mr. Fielding got. You might wonder why I make it curved. Well, as the cattle come around the bend, they think they're going back to where they came from. So that is why that works. And I love the fact that the movie recreated my projects. Now, let's just get back to um, some of the things to help um, 
some of the minds that are different in the workplace. Some people are really bothered by LED lights that flicker. That can be a real problem. You know how you can tell if the LED lights flicker? Uh, take pictures of them in slow motion video. Play it back in slow motion video. And some, that's something that may have to be fixed. Let's say you have a kid that doesn't like loud noise from a hairdryer. Let the kid control the hairdryer where they turn it on and off. Sometimes that can help to desensitize. And there's another picture I sent to Mr. Fielding. And there is a picture of the book. And right now, I want to just get a whole bunch of questions off the audience, because that's what I really like to do. And I think they had like four questions. Like, OK, she's going to go give the mic to some people. So I'm going to get another water opened up here. <laughs> Thank you, Temple. But I always like uh, answering questions. OK, good. So let's an ask some questions. OK, if you could stand up, please. OK, right there in the front. Right there. Stand yeah. up, please. Hello, you just touched on passing up the interview process by showing your Yeah, the way I, what I did, I just your go work. back. Like, that's the drawing right there that back in the late 80s, I sent to the head of Cargill. Okay. And uh, you, you basically want something that's like a 30-second wow. I talked to a lady the other day, she's a photographer, and she'd all been on her third algebra class and flunking it. And I said, one thing about photography is that you can sell photography just based on portfolio. Though I would recommend taking some photography classes. There's some things about photography that you do need to learn. I think she had another part of it. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't get to my question yet, <laughs> excuse me. Um, for, those, for those young adults who a drawing, something like this, is out of their realm, out of their skill set. What do you recommend? How do you bypass the interview process if you have nothing to well, show? Well, I talk to a lot like of corporations, this? and what I'm finding in talking to corporations, some are very willing to change stuff, and others say, ah, oh, we can't change that. So I've gotten the full gamut. Now, the tech industry has actually done a better job on reaching out maybe to the mathematical kids. But, okay, let's see, take something like an airline. They need mechanics. Your best mechanic may interview really badly. Maybe he needs to be showing off the car he rebuilt. Okay, that's showing mechanical ability. You see, because well, you see, part of the thing now is that I was really disturbed about somebody saying, well, a car is just a computer on wheels. Yes, it is a mechanical device controlled by a computer. The whole car is not a computer. You see, that's an example of overgeneralizing. OK, Temple right here. OK. Up, Keep it close to your mouth. So it's actually not a question. It's a compliment. Um, both of us taught, we teach at this one school. And we have lots of children with autism in the classroom. And we saw your movie, and we decided to show it to the whole school, you know, in little batches. And one of our favorite students who is extremely intelligent and has autism, when he saw the pictures in the movie of how you thought, he stood up in front of the whole class, started clapping and saying, that's how I think, I am like her. Yeah, you see, now that is the way I think. And, the, and the, that's the most accurate thing in that movie, is it shows exactly how I think. That is absolutely accurate. And there's a picture in there where all the shoes come up in rapid succession. And, and the mathematical mind thinks more in patterns. See, music and math go together, but art and mechanics go together. I know that sounds weird, but they go together. The art type mind's also good at the mechanical stuff. But we've got kids growing up today never using a tool. Uh, in the visual thinking book, I discuss a doctor who was very frustrated because he had a hard time teaching interns to sew up cuts because they had never used scissors in their life. They had never used a needle and thread. Um, when I did another little book of mine, uh, Calling All Minds, it's little kids' projects, um, 20 to 30 percent of the kids in suburban Denver had never made a paper airplane. So what that tells me is they're totally removed from the world of like real practical things. I'm seeing 60-year-olds playing with Legos because nobody thought to introduce tools. 
I was using tools in second and third grade, hammer, uh, pliers, and screwdriver. Okay, the saw came at fifth grade, hand saw, small hand saw. Mm -hmm. But there we've got kids growing up today totally removed from the world of the practical. Okay, Temple right here. Okay. So keep it close to your mouth. Sure. Hey, Temple, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for all the educating you've done of me over the years as a verbal thinker myself, raising a child who thinks in pictures. It makes a huge difference to have your work in front of us. Uh, right now, he's at ETHS. I do want to applaud ETHS for the opportunities they do give for visual thinkers. Last year, he got to do geometry and construction, where they built a building to learn geometry. This year, he's in auto maintenance, so he's got his hands in that car every day. But he has to take algebra right now. And he's super, right, now wait, super, He's in high school right now? He's in this high school right now. He's in this high school right now? Yeah. And he's getting an A++ in auto. And he's getting Can he a, do geometry? He's getting a C- in algebra. All right, wait, wait, wait a minute. Now, can he do geometry? He did it last year. He built well, he needs, a building. I think he needs to skip the algebra. OK. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Now, what would could, I Could I, you tell let, the head of the school? Let me talk about a little, a little thought experiment. Is, let's say I was in his, his shoes, and I couldn't graduate from high school. Let's say I'm 18 years old, a magic wand has been waved. I'm 18 years old, low income background, but I still have all my knowledge. I'd go get a job in a factory or get a job in one of those big warehouses. And my goal would be to design the next uh, uh, you know, computer controlled warehouse. I've seen that path in the meat industry where you learn every job on the floor and you move up, but you have to pay your dues. And there's a back door, there's a huge back door. And a lot of the people I worked with went in the back door. A lot of them started with a single welding class or grew up working on cars. That was the background. And they started, they'd build something small for a factory. And the factory liked them. And then the factory would have them build bigger things. And none of the people that built my equipment were any good at algebra. You know, maybe, maybe replace the algorithm with statistics, something where you can relate it back to something real, or maybe the electrical engineering book that is in uh, my room. Uh, anyone's really interested in that, I'll give you the room number I'm after the talk. I've got that book out on the table, 1930s electrical engineering book. But I think we really got to think about some of these things, because we're screening out a whole class of thinkers and we have so much stuff falling apart. I couldn't believe it flying into San Jose, the lack of solar panels on the roof. It's amazing what you can see out the window of an airplane if you just look. OK. Yeah, if you need somebody to do that. Keep the microphone close to your mouth. OK. Hi there. I have a question. I have, sure. I have a 2E son who is struggling terribly in English. He is an extreme visual thinker. He He's was a kind of thinker? visual thinker? I'm not, like an art thinker or more of a math thinker? I'm not really sure. He, we had him evaluated and on the visual how, spatial. How old, how old is he? He's 15 as of yesterday. What's he, he good at? Legos. All right. Has he ever been introduced to tools? A little bit. No. He needs to learn how to use tools. Yep. Because maybe he's one of those kids that ought to go into a high-end skilled trade. I. Probably. He's but, but how can you find out you like tools if you never use them? You see, this gets back to the whole exposure thing. And a lot, all these people I worked with that couldn't do algebra, they all you know, tool users, and they were all um, well patenting and designing equipment, mechanical things like the similar. And factories need that stuff. He's been involved in makerspace in junior high, so he's had some experience with tools. The other thing, he's got to learn some job skills. Yes, very Instead much so. he's legal, he needs to start getting a job. <laughs> uh, but let's start, introduce tools. So my question is, what do you do with somebody who is failing English who... All right, now as far as English goes, I'm, I'm, uh, can he read and write at the sixth grade level? He's a great reader, writing OK, now what terrible. about typing? I don't care about handwriting. What about, can he type a business letter? Yes, he can. I, I mean, I learned things in sixth grade, like a business letter fits on one page. Well, that still applies to emails. You don't write like 500 word emails. You know, if you figure out what you're going to say concisely, 
we got to start thinking about what can this kid do? You see, I spent 25 years in heavy construction. It's all about outcomes. Getting a project built and making it work. No. See, how can we get him to a good outcome? Uh, it looks like he's hardly tried tools. How about working on cars? Got anybody in the neighborhood that likes to tinker around with cars? That's how one of the people that patented and built some of my more complicated equipment started. He was a classic car fanatic. Temple back here. Okay. Keep it close to your mouth. Hi, um, I'm a speech pathologist and I've worked with lots of kids with autism and, and I was just curious since you've explained the way that you do think in pictures, um, did working on language skills with speech pathologists over the years change anything about your language skills? Well, I, um, you know, I had delayed speech, I didn't talk until age four and I uh, I didn't read until age eight. Mother taught me with reading with phonics. Now I already knew my ABC song. The ABC song has half the sounds. So mother pinned the alphabet up on the wall and had me memorize the sounds. Then she'd get a book worth reading, about a fifth grade, sixth grade level book like The Wizard of Oz. And she'd read a whole page and then have me sound out a, a bit of it. That's what she did. And, and I, uh, and then I went from no reading to sixth grade level reading. And there's other kids that are whole word learners, and you mess them up with phonics. So you've got to use the method that works. And uh, you want to, you, these kids that get a label, one of the things that is kind of a basic principle is uneven skills. Very good at one thing and awful at something else. And we need to be looking, how can we take the thing they're naturally good at, turn it into a career? That's what, I want to, that's what I want to do. And even the ones that cannot talk, some of them can learn to type. They want meaningful work. Don't make them do busy work. Then you wonder why they throw a fit, because you're making them do something stupid that's just busy work. I went to some places that uh, were uh, you know, facilities um, where adults with a non, no verbal speech lived. Well, one guy, his meaning in life was to go down to the chicken house and get two eggs and bring them back and cook them and eat them for breakfast. You see, that's something that's real. You want to teach them the colors? Well, then get the colors to apply to something real, like traffic lights and crossing the street. You see, as a visual thinker, I just start seeing how I can turn that into real things. Now, let's try to figure out what they can do. Because the people I worked with, the, People are building big, complicated, expensive stuff that I worked with. They'd be playing video games in the basement right now. We've got factories falling apart, and they can't find people to fix factories. And we're supposed to build all these chip-making factories. Well, why don't you show the kids some videos of the inside of a chip-making factory? Let's get them interested in something that can turn into a really cool job. Temple right here. Uh, hi. Um, I have ADHD, and I've also been really involved in scouting. Like I was, well, scouting's a great activity. I'm yeah, absolutely. I was. I was wondering your, um, like, what you think about scouting, because like I was a senior patrol leader of my troop for a year, and that really helped with like my leadership skills and becoming way more confident in myself. Just scouting activities yes, I in totally general. Think that's wonderful. Scouting, showing animals that they, you know, all these kind of things that get you out doing things. You know, scouting is a really great thing. Maker spaces, that's another thing that we need to be doing. Getting kids doing more real stuff. Real stuff that can you know, lead to a career. I got interested in the cattle industry because I was exposed to it as a teenager. I did not come from an ag background. I hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch in Arizona, I wouldn't be in the cattle industry. It is that simple. You know, students have to get exposed to a lot of stuff. Temple over here. Could you okay. Keep it close to your mouth. I have a question about the film about your life, and you mentioned that they, uh, the editors showed exactly how you think uh, in the film. Did you have a say in how it's supposed to look, or did you let them? I didn't. Uh, Some of the abuse reverberation, I'm trouble hearing you. Yeah, he can't um, talk a little louder. I have a question about the film. That you okay. about your life 
and about how you think. Yeah, it shows how I think. That's accurate. Right. Did the editors show how you thought uh, on their own, or did you have a say in how you're supposed to, how it's supposed to look, I, how I, you thought? I, I talked to the editor. Also, Mick Jackson, the director, is a visual thinker. No, I talked to them a lot about it, too. But they got it really right. I can also tell you that starting my business in the early 70s in the cattle industry, being a woman was a bigger barrier than autism. And where I got most of the discrimination was the foreman level, middle management. That's where just about all my troubles were. Uh, we've decided to do the book signing out in the hallway. It's going to be a little bit simpler instead of on stage here. Uh, we're right at about 8 o'clock. Maybe we take one more question. We'll take one more one. question, okay? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Sir. Sorry. I, did, I couldn't see which hand it was. How do we get teachers to teach in a way that allows all different thinkers to thrive when they're in the same environment? Okay, that's almost so, uh, so generalized, I almost can't answer it. You see, this is, see, this is where, um, and I have, see, I have parents will say to me, or teachers will say to me, well, how do I teach kids with autism? Well, if there's a three-year-old, I can give you my standard speech on early intervention. But I've got to know more about the kid. What's the problem? Uh, you know, is it sound sensitivity? They can't do algebra. What exactly is the problem? Is he bullied in school? What is the problem? See, this is where the verbal thinker overgeneralizes. And I'm seeing so much of getting trapped into the labels. You see, now I'm seeing pictures, the shops that I've worked with, and the, and the in-house engineering departments have been shut down. The Montfort Fab Shop, there was a big company back 20 years ago called Montfort. It's a huge metal fabrication shop. They sold all the equipment out of that. They fix trucks in it now. And the thing is, you don't realize what you've lost until you've lost it. And, and they were, then they were farming the workout just locally. You see, they were not getting stuff from China. This was uh, just local. And then as the local shops were tired out, now it's biting them in the butt big time. And they can't get people to fix some stuff and the one shop that's left is ripping them off right now. Oh, man, price gouging like you wouldn't believe. And they have to wait eight months to get it. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they signed the contract for them. I talked to them yesterday. You see, this is the thing what I'm trying to do is kind of go back and forth between the industrial world and the education world. And the visual thinking like me, it's a different kind of thought. And the final chapter in the visual thinking book is about animal consciousness. And I think that a lot of that gets down to if a person thinks totally in words, they might have a hard time imagining a dog is conscious. Mm -hmm. Because the people that tend to think a dog doesn't really think, I look at the author affiliations, psychology department, where I look at the, the math, mathematician computer guys, they think a dog thinks. And you look at the affiliation. But I've been really, it's really interesting, you know, thinking about it, because um, I've been trying to think about how I could think in a detailed way with no visual thinking. But I want to emphasize people are mixtures of the object visualizer, the more mathematical visualizer, and the word thinker. Most people are mixtures, but the kids with labels tend to be the extremes. And if we pound away on the deficits, they're going, that kid needs to skip algebra. Uh, it's just that simple. Let's take a class in business math so he can run his shop. Okay. okay. Thank you all Thank for you coming. Everybody. Thank you. Great to be here.